Morgan King probably needs no introduction. He's a double-wristing watch aficionado, affectionately known as a magical man of mystery, a New York native and an L.A. resident. He's also one of my favorite people to hang out with, full stop. I'm thrilled Morgan took the time to come on the show because his energy is simply unmatched. Let's get to it. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Hello, beautiful. The King. How are you, baby? <laughs> How are you, my man? Chilling. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I had um, I was trying to buy these Comic Con tickets to meet uh, some of the the uh, the good old boys comedians, actors slash, you know, personalities. I'm like, I got to get them before they sell out. You know how I am. Oh, I know how you are. But uh, more importantly, it, that's like next summer, obviously, right? Well, that's San Diego. We're talking about L.A., baby. That's in December. Oh, there's a Comic-Con in L.A.? Yes, there is a cousin. I'm sorry, my video wasn't even on. I was just running around doing stuff. No, it's all good. I didn't think you had pants on, which was, you know, like I said, it helps the audio. I don't have pants on. Do you hear the uh, grass people <laughs> cutting the grass outside? No, you're all good. Good. Will this will, will the video be recorded? Is it is this? A, am I going to be on video or is it just strictly podcast? Podcast. I, I'm in the pool house, and when I'm in the pool house, um, I smoke cigars, and so I kind of have like that. Ooh, should I wear my smoking jacket? Well, then again, are you recording this? If you're not, because I can I can wear my smoking jacket, and I'll be I'll be like really just chilling out. This is your forum, and more importantly, you're in your own home, so you get to do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> Fine. So let's let me let me put on something a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, more Morgan, if you will. Uh, I was gonna say a little more Hugh Hefner. <laughs> Ooh, you like that? Okay. Let's. What do I have? That's Hugh Hefner. Oh yes, my Hugh Hefner. Ah, there it is. That is Hugh Hefner. That is literally Hugh Hefner. It is a red velour smoking jacket with black satin lapel. <laughs> and I have one for you too. Oh my goodness. I have I always have two smoking jackets because when you're in my smoking gallery, you we smoke together. See, there's one for you, there's one for me. Okay, so this is is this sort of like your office or is it more of like just your place for memorabilia? It is my children's pool house that I have commandeered, and now it is now my pool house. So okay. Everything you see here is kind of like, you know, my homage. It's kind of like my office, actually. Yeah, you know, like I like little things. Top Gun. I know you're a top Tomcat fourteen guy. Oh, for sure. Yeah, of course. Original Top Gun. Original Top Gun with the whole um. I don't know about you, but G.I. Joe was a huge thing for me, too. G.I. Joe's, they used the uh, the F-14 Tomcats. I think, oh, yeah, the aircraft carriers and Robotech and the X-Wings. I like little, you know, I'm like a Godzilla kind of guy, you know, right. always, <laughs> with the whole complex Batman, Superman, you name it, rovers. That's the kind of thing that I've been going around. So that's kind of fun. I love that. Well, as I've said before, us men, we don't grow up. We just get older and our toys get more expensive. Sir, you are correct. Okay, so what's the cigar of choice this morning? I mean, it is 10 a.m., so do you change the cigar based on time of day, or is it just the vibe in general? It is It is a combination of both. What I do a lot of times is I, I, I put my hand in my humidor and I pull out something. So today, I pulled out two things. I have a 50th anniversary of Padron which is a limited edition that you can only buy for five years from a batch starting back in 2014. Okay. So from 2004 to 2019, you can only buy these. And I had to, you have to buy the humidor, you have to buy the lighter. You have to go to Davidov of, uh, of, the, of in Madison, New York. I have a guy there that, that makes, that will allow you to buy it. So you're able to buy one box at 50 for 50 of Rosario and you can buy a replacement box for every next five years. So you technically could have 250 of these sticks. Right. And I'm down to like six. Oh, out of the 250, have you had 250? I, I had 250, I bought all five units. <laughs> uh, I've shared some, I've smoked some, but now all I know is I have six left. 
And of course, I have a 1964, which is what they call the pyramid, which is nice. The torpedo. Torpedo. So this one is nice. I already had this clipped. I, apparently, I must have must have taken it somewhere and just didn't get a chance to um to smoke it. So I put it back in the humidor because you can't leave these out. These are like leaves, right? The dry leaves. So you have right, to sure, them. sure. Well, I have a padrone that you gave me, and I I don't remember which one that was. I still have it actually. It's in the humidor. Yes. Yes, of course. Good, good. As long as it's in the humidor, you're you're in good order because they're like leaves; they'll last forever. So. So I, um, what I should do is, is save it and then we smoke it in your pool house together. No, no, no. You smoke it. And then when you come in, well, I have more cigars for you. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So how'd you, how did, how did you get into cigars? When did that start? Well, cigars started back in 1993 when I graduated out of Babson College in Boston. And I was living with a whole bunch of seniors that were graduating and a lot of them were going to New York or to Boston. At the time I was taking a job. Ooh, I was taking a job with my girlfriend's brother at the time. So I knew that I was going to Miami and we took out some sticks and I never smoked before. And they're like, we have to do this. This has to be, we have to drink some scotch and we have to smoke cigars to honor our um, departure, if you will, to the real world, to be real men, to be captains of our industry. Okay. I said, okay, let's do it. So I sat down and I think it was some like Swisher Sweets. It was like some sort of garbage looking cigar. <laughs> From a bodega. It was like, yeah, it was something crazy. And this was back in Boston. So there was a place called Cigar Masters back in the day on off Newberry Street that a lot of the uh, more mature students that were smoking cigars, you know, who, who were educated by their dads in Europe or, you know, uh, I went to school with like the Bacardi family, the, the Bacardi Rum, Ford, Motor Cars, Starbucks, uh, you know, all these entrepreneurs that are going to take over the family business or at least being the executive there, Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so a lot of those cats were at Cigar Masters. But for me and my my New York City hoodlum slash uh, a guy from um, Quincy, Massachusetts, which is kind of like, you know, it's an honest city neighborhood, but it's also one of those places where, you know, you get some grit, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. So we, you know, we ended up hanging out there, smoked a cigar, had a little bit of an alcohol um I had a shot. I don't really drink alcohol. I'm allergic to it. So right. I kind of like faked that I was drinking it. And I kind of mixed it with like some water. Um, but it was memorable to me. I'm kind of like, what's the word called? I'm very nostalgic. I'm very, very loyal. So yeah. if something like sticks with me, I kind of honor it by uh, continuing um, the process. So when I went to Miami, of course, at the time I was with my girlfriend's brother, who also graduated with me, not with me, with me in Babson, but University of Miami. So he was a hurricane and he graduated in just the same. So he was like, you know what? You're dating my sister. She obviously trusts you. I think I trust you with my sister. So I'll trust you with helping me with the business. Why don't you come and help me? I need someone in, in the finance accounting department. Can you do it? Have you been to Miami? I'm like, well, the farthest I've ever been is Boston. You know, from a New York City kid. So New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. I think the farthest I've ever been was like Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Okay. Right, right, right. Two hours. <laughs> I'll go to Miami. I'll do it. Maybe I went to Orlando or something, or maybe I went to Orlando after, but it was one of those things where I just never really traveled. Cause you know, you're from New York. Where else can do you really need to go? Right. Um, right. So I did that and I was there for about a good three years. And well, two years actually, I was there for two years until my, my girlfriend graduated and came down to Miami. So that was kind of nice. And now she's my wife. So long story so, short. Okay. So the job was like an accounting role. It was kind of like the, it was back in the dot-com era. Sure. So we're running around and doing all these like, he started as an entrepreneur. He wanted to do uh, video games. So he was with Nintendo, Sega, um, Sony, PlayStation. This was back in 90 years, so it just started. But right. Super Mario was a thing. Uh, you know, Sonic, uh, Dream, uh, the Dreamcast was a thing also. And this is when uh, the Game Boy was still in black and white. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Kind of like, burgeoning so he wanted to be an import export and because my wife girlfriend at the time is chinese brazilian they're from brazil so they have their father was an entrepreneur that did a lot of um kind of like the radio shack almost they sold components batteries you name it you know little widgets they had that in brazil and um he had a couple of locations that ended up doing quite well so when he graduated he kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur himself and 
Yeah. Just, you know, video games, the kind of thing it's, it's, it's easy in the sense that everything's already marketed. You don't have to really create the games, but you get to provide the hardware. And of course the game, the console itself in order to sell. Sure. And that was done in Paraguay and Brazil. So that, that was, that was a good time. It really was a good time. So they needed someone that was kind of like, kind of organized, kind of uh, honest. And that was me, apparently a guy from New York city, which you, you know, you know, now since we're friends, never trust, me. you know, what, <laughs> what, okay. So wait, so how long were you a in that role or B with that company or like what, what, how did that all unfold? Cause you're obviously not doing that today. I'm not doing that today. So one of the, are we recording this? Is, are we doing the podcast already? Or are we just talking? This is it, man. This is okay, it. Okay, fine. I want to make sure because sometimes, you know, with you and me, we're buddies, we're boys. And, you know, yeah. I'll say things that are just completely not radio friendly. Okay. Well, I mean, that's also welcome, but I'll leave that up to you. Well, well, I have children and I'm a, I'm, I'm a man of class, you see. Okay. <laughs> In my red Q Hefner um, smoking mm-hmm. jacket. I took a screenshot, just FYI. <laughs> Oh, well, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy a cigar. Please do. I'm in the pool house. I'm surrounded by a good friend that I love to. Well, we we've had quite a bit of run, right? We we hung out at little Dom's. We we tried our run for lasagna, but it wasn't on a Friday, so we got to go. Well, it wasn't a Friday. I know you got good memory. I um yeah, stupid stupid me. It was a Tuesday. <laughs> Not stupid, sir. That is a silly rule. Why they only make lasagna on Fridays? <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of silly. I, uh, is there was, like a, a, an Italian grandma hanging out somewhere that only works on Fridays? No, they make it every day. So make it every day. Come on. That's right. Uh, that's right. The ingredients are available. Make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of bread, a little cheese, a little bit of tomato juice. You're good. You're good. Yeah. Anyway, back to our story. We we're talking about. So how long were you with that business? So the company was called US One. Or no, I'm sorry. Not US One. It was BR One. Uh, BR1.com or BR1 America. So it was BR for Brazil, of course, because my brother-in-law now is a Brazilian, a very proud Brazilian, but you know, we're Chinese. So they speak Portuguese, they speak Spanish, they speak Taiwanese, they speak China, Chinese. Um, and I'm originally from Taiwan. I was born in Taiwan. So so uh, we have this Taiwanese, you know, nationality, which as you know, is uh, it's kind of been in the news lately. Yes. Ukraine. So it's kind of political. We're kind of keeping track of what's going on because we're like, you know, Whatever happens to Ukraine is probably going to happen to Taipei, Taiwan, and we're like, oh, I don't know. So anyway, we're 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 very very um, nationalistic that way. Um, now, how did that happen? So I met Ellie, who's my wife now, but my at the time I was girlfriend. She was an international girl from Brazil, of all places, São Paulo, Brazil. And when she came, she was a freshman, but she was she went to American private school in Brazil. So she spoke English. She was taught by expats. Uh, but around the city, she speak Portuguese. At home, she speak Taiwanese or Mandarin Chinese. And of course, when we came to America, uh, living in L.A., she picked up Spanish because, you know, it's a thing you do, right? Obviously, if you speak right. Portuguese, you probably pick up Spanish pretty well. Um, so that happened. And so when that happened, back, rewind, of course, back in 93, I was a freshman in college. I met Ellie in 95. So my wife was a freshman coming at 95 and I was already a junior at the time. And she was really cute. You know, I was like, yo, what's up? This, this pinchy, as they say in Portuguese, caliente, uh, freshman from Brazil. And, you know, she played the part. She was Brazilian. She wore the tight clothes. Everything you heard about Brazilians are true. They're very passionate and they're very, very caliente, pinchy. You know what I'm saying? Ooh. Now she's respectable. Now she's a mother. Now she's, you know, mother of three. Uh, classy lady, but back then, wow, those pictures that we had, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so what was your question? I, I digress. How long were you with the company? <laughs> Duh. Um, so I was working with her brother from ninety nine to two. From, I'm sorry, from ninety seven because I graduated ninety seven to ninety nine. Okay, up to September of nineteen ninety nine. Okay. Because Ellie, at the time, was two years younger than me. So when she graduated, we were. she also was wanting to be an entrepreneur. And she was like, let's do something different. You know, my uh, I got this I got this contact that's doing security cameras um, in Taipei being created with by Sony. So Sony internals. Sony Guts, you know, as Adam, Adam sure. Sandler would say, Sony Guts. So Sony Guts 
Uh, it was a guy that her dad had met on a golfing course, right? Just had a golf course and they're hanging out, they're talking about it. And they found out that he was manufacturing these for the business in Asia. And they needed a, a distributor in America. So it was perfect. So she's like, you know what? I got a daughter who just graduated. She's hungry for business. Let's uh, let's do a deal. So through uh, some manipulation slash, you know, courtesy calls, everyone vying for each other, making sure that everyone's vetted, it made sense. So my father-in-law has told my daughter, well, not my daughter, his daughter, my right, wife, right. girlfriend at the time, uh, that, hey, I got this opportunity where he's importing, exporting cameras. He wants to do it in America. Do you want to take a chance? This is something that, uh, you know, didn't you study for, to do this, to be an entrepreneur? And she's like, yeah, I did. All right, let's do it. She's like, yeah. Why don't you go to L.A. and do it? Because at least it's coming from Asia. It'll drop in L.A. It'll be right there. You could, you know, it'll show up in containers. Right, the port, yeah. At least, you know, you're close to the port of authority. You're, you're uh, as far as of L.A., Vegas, which needs a lot of cameras, a lot of uh, San Francisco PD, LAPD, NYPD, all these different locations. So we ended up starting with that. And when that happened, Ellie was like, I'm going to L.A. I was working for her brother at the time doing video games. And he was like, hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to go with me? And I was like, we're not married. We're just dating. And you want me to go to L.A. with you? And I'm working for your brother at the current moment? Hey, why not, right? Let's yeah. <laughs> So, of course, little New Yorker me, the guy that was always going to live and die in New York, who went to Boston just for a little hiatus. Because I was like, come on. Well, also, let's let's face it. I'm pretty sure Ellie looked better in the tight clothes than her brother did. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> her brother is quite handsome, you see. And I was a little bit smitten by him. But you're right. You're right. He he, he did massage my back the way that, that Ellie right. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so... I guess I, you sort of named the businesses you guys were targeting, I guess, you know, like the police departments and I'm assuming hotels and stuff in Vegas. Right. A lot right. of these um, now to not because I, I need to go back a little bit more and I apologize. I digress. As you know, talk to me. I, I keep talking until that's, you tell me. Otherwise. That's what these podcasts are all about, man. They wander. Well, I am completely officially unemployed and homeless. So, I'm living in a pool house right now in my bathroom. <laughs> um, so I have all the time in the world. As long as uh, as long as you have until 3 p.m. Because I need to get my children by that. Oh, no, no. I, w- <laughs> as much as I as much as I want to do the Rogan thing of three hours, like I, I can't. Um, I actually am recording another podcast later. <laughs> See, you're the hardest working guy I know in San Diego. Oh, well, in San Diego, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, you're in San Diego, right? So technically, you're probably you're probably the state of California right now on a Friday <laughs> Friday morning. You are the hardest working man I know. Kudos to you, sir. Kudos to you, Arthur. Thank you, buddy. So my wife has two other brothers, and the middle brother went to Boston University. So he too was an entrepreneur. So when he graduated, he went to Miami to work with her other his other brother. And of course, all of them are entrepreneurs. Right. So going back to the whole camera, he decided to do also security cameras for Brazil and Paraguay. That was okay. his market. But because he was Brazilian, he was in the free zone. He didn't really want to deal with the American market because then, you know, Americans, as you know, are, are a little bit more finicky, right? Customers always right. You know, it needs to be done the right way. It needs to look a certain way. And he didn't want anything with it. He was very impatient. He was just like, ah, Americans are horrible. They want net terms. They want to pay in the six months to a year. Never mind. I want COD, cash on delivery. So he only dealt with Latin America because that's how they were. Right. Uh, they would pay in advance. They left him leave the deposit. And when the item was about to ship, they sent the rest of them out. And boom, instant cash, instant money. Love but the it. Americans were more like wine and dine, consignment. If they like the items, they, they, they'll, they'll order a lot. But if they didn't like the item, you could return it. Uh, they'd pay you in like net 30 days, 90 days, sometimes 120 days. So sure. it could either make or break you. Um, fast forward, we had dealt with like companies like Costco as well as uh, Walmart, um, as well as Amazon. And, but it got to a point where their return policy was like almost like we'll buy a million units from you. But if we don't like it, we can return a million units and you have to give us credit for it. And we're like, right. oh. Let's not do that. Let's yeah. let's let's put all the eggs in one basket. So that's why that market was, for us was a little bit more um, volatile, if you will. But we did that in 1999, and we did it for about 20 years. Security cameras. So we we did sell to Vegas, L.A., 
New York. We sold to NASA. We sold to a lot of uh, integrators, which basically were clients that climbed up the ladders to install things for banks and celebrities. Since we're located in City of Industry, California, we were in the LA market. So a lot of our, I can't, I can't really say because of uh, NDAs, but uh, there are a lot of celebrities right now who are in their house with my cameras in it. And even after, this is like 2019 is when we closed the, uh, retired the company, um, where they still have our cameras in it. And I'm still getting calls like, hey, do you service this? Where can I get another one? I'm like, I'm out, buddy. I'm out. Yeah. Uh, call this guy. Call that guy. So uh, it, it was a great market, a great experience for 20 years. But I think um, we decided to leave that because our kids were growing up at the time. Because we, we started the business together when I was 24 and she was 22 or maybe 21. Sure. So I was maybe 23. So we were young. We, we just got out of college. And, you know, you had to have that gusto. You wanted to be fired. Well, it's also... It's also the best time to start a business. As somebody who didn't start my business until I was 35, 36, I think I was 35. Um, when you're 23, man, you got all the time in the world to make mistakes, you know? And that's why I think also my brand and company have grown so slowly because I've been extremely conservative in my older age, as opposed to if I were 23, like, I just wish... I had done it at 23 and not 35, you know, but I think that's a common, that's a common regret that a lot of people say is the only regret I have is not starting sooner. I agree, but I disagree because oh, okay, you have all these experiences that you've gotten because you're in the retail, you know, uh, haberdashery slash personal. That's true. You know, bespoke industry. Yeah. You would not have had any of these experiences slash, um, you know, skill sets that you have with you now. That's true. Right. So yeah. I believe you are exactly where you're supposed to be, sir. Thanks, man. What did you study at Babson? <laughs> wow. Um, I think I failed most of my classes. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I was, I majored in marketing and human communications and I minored in anthropology, which is a study of man. What it, <laughs> Uh, I, that, that came in useful apparently. So, uh, I, I think, but you said you were good at, you said, you said you were good at speaking. Is that what you said? You kind of broke up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of good at speaking. I, I have a gift for gab. Uh, well you and I both, right. Cause we're both kind of in retail. Yeah. I worked in, uh, going back and forth, but back when I was younger in New York, I would work for my uncle, uh, uncle Howie in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And he had this big and tall shop basically on fifth Avenue and, um, ninth street. I love this story because you told it to me once. And at, what was it like? You have to, as long as you can get here, it was like during the summer when you were a kid. Right. And you had to be there at like 7 AM, but it was an hour commute or something. Well, I was, I lived in Bayside Queens. So right. I was in Bayside, which is right off Springfield Boulevard in order to get to Brooklyn at, as a 13 year old kid who's getting paid like $60 on, on a Saturday, which was great money for me. I was like, are you kidding me? Back in like 1989. Sure. You know, back in the day. So I started at 13, but at 13, I think he was nice. He, he would, I would stay with him in Jersey during the summer. So he would pick me up. He would, he would wake me up. I'd crash over his place in Jersey uh, with my cousins. It was a great time. Um, he'd drive to Brooklyn all the way from New Jersey because he was from Marlboro, New Jersey. Okay. But as I got older and went to high school, then I, of course I had to take a bus. So I woke up at seven in the morning to take the Q27 all the way to Main Street Flushing, take the seven train, which is, you know, a lot of New Yorkers know you take the seven train to go to Shea Stadium for the Mets, right? But I was going the other way. I was going to Brooklyn. I was heading out west. So I would take the seven train, transfer at Queensboro for the Q and the R and the G train at Smith and Ninth, and then get off at you know, uh, Horton Skimmerhorn, where it was a kind of a shady area. So you kind of have to know how to dodge, run fast if someone spotted and wanted what you were wearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you had to, I learned fast. I learned fast uh, how it was in Brooklyn. And this is before Brooklyn hipsters was a thing. There are no beards, there are no electric bikes, <laughs> uh, you know. The IPA was minimal. <laughs> IPA was non-existent, sir. No so denim. So as somewhat of a flashy guy, and I and I mean that like with with like as a compliment, 
what were you wearing back then? Like, did you, were you a sneaker guy or were, were you like, what, what were you into at that age? Well, I grew, I grew up very blue collar. I was the fa, I was the son of first, uh, first level immigrants, if you will, like first wave. I don't know what, the, what what's the terminology? Uh, As a white man, I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> Well, enough said. Yes, agreed. But uh, my parents were for, they immigrated from from Taiwan. Uh, father's originally from Shanghai. My mom originally is from Ningbo, which is a city by Shanghai. But okay. they, they they met in Taiwan. They had my brother, my sister, and me, and then moved to America when I was about nine months old. And they had my younger brother David in New York City. Cool. So he's the only one that actually is very hairy, oddly <laughs> enough. So. I guess it must have been the American milk or something. But Italian is it, too much pasta. It's the pasta. <laughs> Forget about it, huh? That's the way it is. So once again, I digress. What were we talking about? No, we were just talking about like what you like to wear back then. But um, me being a uh, blue collar uh, boy, I always kind of want to look the part. I always kind of part of me always want to be seen and recognized, if you will, in essence. Yeah. Maybe that's kind of why I am who I am now. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit off, but I, I like to you know, be seen a little bit, at least be acknowledged. That's something that's important to me. Um, so I would kind of wear stuff that was always kind of hip, nothing like crazy, but it was something that it had a little bit of flash, a little bit of color to it. So my uncle in Brooklyn, he had a big and tall store, but also had a whole bunch of other clothing. So he sold like Timberland boots. He sold Columbia sportswear, Levi's jeans, the 501, the 505s. Mm -hmm. So denim was a key thing. Um, Carhartt, which is still a, a great brand. But back then, it was like used for construction workers. Dude, it sounds like you're describing Busta Rhymes. Like, <laughs> you know, because that dude, isn't he like 6'4? Like, <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, this is, you know, this is hard work, uh, working class clothing that, you know, when hip hop picked up, a lot of the, the rappers as well as uh, some of the musical talents of the day would, would wear. So yeah. it, it just meshed, right? Of That's course, cool. we also had uh, your your typical, you know, your MA one, which was kind of like your the the, um, the Navy MA one, which is I guess the military aviation jackets, right? Back mm -hmm. the top ones around the orange lining inside, but it had burgundy, the the olive gray of the Navy, kind of like what Alpha uh, sells, right? As far as those jackets were concerned, pea coats, you name it. It was kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. So I would always pick up something and wear something that was kind of cool, kind of hip. But yeah, those cats on in Brooklyn on the G train or the R train would spot me and be like, yo, I want that jacket. Where'd you get that jacket? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh, you can go to Square Stores on. Uh I'll sell you one. I'll sell you one. <laughs> I'll sell you one. He's like, no, no, no. That's, yeah, that's that's not how it works. <laughs> I'm like, and I was like, I'll see you later. I'll just, I'll just book. There's so many times I would go between trains because back then they, were, they still had cops on the train every now and then, like Port Authority security slash, you know, uh, auxiliary police at times so i would always find one of them uh or at least know where which which car they were in when i got in it's just so I, I kind of would avoid that because you know i was young at the time 13 14 15 years old uh yeah. i it's all the way until i was in high school so long until i was 18 so you know you kind of have to be a little bit smarter of what you have to do and uh, make sure that you uh weren't wearing anything too flashy so i never wore my air jordans Right. Uh, maybe my Nike Agassiz at the time. I did have. Uh, yeah, the the like the splattered hot pink. Or, hot uh, pink, baby. Yeah. Hot orange. Reverse the green. Yes, sir. That's sick. All right. So when did double wristing enter your life? <laughs> double wristing. Oh, we're talking about watches now. That's right. Because, I mean, when did the watches come in for you? Watches came in, as you know, like from the other uh sites that I, we've been talking about you know, we met through watches right right i started picking it up back in junior high school when i got the swatches uh the pop swatches a really major hit of mine and i love everything plastic because it's just so fun swatches are so fun nowadays um and even back then they were they were awesome they were affordable they were ones that i could afford uh so i wore the swatches and i ended up i guess getting my first official watch uh in as a senior in high school, 93, when I went to Switzerland. And my buddy John and his mother was working at UN, and he, he told me to go to Geneva with him. So I went to Geneva with him. And in Geneva, I ended up picking up a swatch, uh, I'm sorry, a Swiss Army knife, some Swiss chocolates, and a tag Corey F1 plastic bezel. Amazing. It's, uh, it's still with me now. I still have it. 
I'm not wearing it right now, but uh, I have it. It's uh, I'll show it to you later. I think I brought it. You've seen it before, right? I think so. Yeah. It was a quartz movement, so it still was not. It, it stopped working a few years back, but when I was back at uh, the Tag Heuer Museum at Champs de France at a heritage event, the, the the repair guys were so cool where they actually placed all the parts. So I now have a working F1 quartz Tag Heuer one watch again. So it's it's awesome. So those guys are great. Um, what was your Double question? Oh my gosh, devil wristing. Double wrestling. See, there you go. So at the time when I was wearing uh, my tag quarter, I would wear swatches as well because, as you remember, the CEO of Swatch, right, Mr. Hayek, he represented Omega, Breguet, uh, you name it, uh, Harry Winston. Like at the time back then, he had so many watches. So he literally had four watches in one arm and four watches in the other. And I remember seeing a picture of that and thinking, that's just crazy. But they kind of like, it just kind of stuck in the back of my head always. And I just, you know, just remembered having it. So to me, it wasn't weird to have two watches, one on each wrist, apparently. Okay. So this is twofold. It's you as somebody who wants to be noticed, wants to be seen, combined with a nod to Hayek? I first saw it that way. I never wow. thought of wearing it that way. But when I saw Hayek wearing it, I was just kind of like, yo, that's kind of cool. Like, he, like at first, I wondered, why was he wearing that? Because I didn't know that Swatch Group had owned all these watch brands. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, as a young kid, I just thought, yo, this guy is nuts. Like, he's crazy. When in reality, he's a billboard. Like, <laughs> right. um, I think when it, it started really happening when I was wearing a watch, the first time I wore double wristed out of the house was when I was wearing one of my swatches and it was on a really, really tough um, rubber strap that I couldn't take off. And okay. I wanted to wear another swatch on my wrist. Oh, and you couldn't get the other one off? I couldn't get the other off. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So my, my, I think it was my sister, Judy, she was like, just wear the other one. Put it, you got two wrists, put it on. Yeah. So I would put it on and I'd walk around. I kind of felt weird that way. Right. I eventually started wearing uh, them more and more when I would end up going to play poker. Because I love playing poker. You smoke cigars. You have a good time with some of my friends. And one of my buddies was looking at me saying, why are you wearing two watches? And I'm like, I don't know, just because I can, I guess. Right. He's like, oh, that's LA time and that's pimp time, baby. And I was like, LA time, pimp time. And that's kind of how that catchphrase happened. Right, right. Uh, so I, I, I give uh, homage to Edward Cock. His name is Cock. <laughs> Believe it or not. So there you go. I, I'm dropping a name that, you know, he doesn't, he's a very private person, but I give, I, I coined that term by him. So thank you, Edward Cock. Okay. So since it, that's hilarious, since it um, sort of originated with the same brand, Swatch, do you always double wrist with the same brand or do you ever mix it up? I've only seen you do brand on brand, you know, Rolex, Rolex, Omega, Omega, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Um, yes and no. Sometimes it, it, it varies. Most of the time, from what I've realized, and I think I've noticed this, when I wear watches, because I don't know if you know how I do things, but I have my watches in, in banks and in safe deposit boxes. So when I go, I don't label them. They're all in this green leather pouch. So I don't know what watches I go when I when I exchange them or rotate them around. I'll just take oh, them. Oh, really? Them. And I'll pull them out. And oddly enough, a lot of them are either Rolex or Rolex, Rolex and Omega, Breitling, Hoyer, Swatch. Um, those are the watches that I grab. So when I pull them out, I'm like, oh, a Swatch, cool. I pull another, oh, another Swatch, cool. So I'll wear them for that week or for that time period before I go back and exchange them. And it's really a great time. Uh, so it's not done on purpose. Sometimes if I'm going to an event where I know it's like, hey, it's going to be, let's say, a Panerai sponsored event, I'll make sure I wear two Panerais. Because, you know, you want to be respectful. You want to, you don't want to wear, I don't know, a Rolex to a Panerai event, right? Or vice versa, or, or a Rolex to a Mega event. That's just, that's just. Right, right. They'll keep you out for that. Or they won't okay. give you the jury. So what's on wrist right now? I think I know, but for the for the listeners at home, if you all, well, this is radio, so you can't see it, but I'm wearing the Neptune Moonshine with the gold second hand. So that's kind of cool. Um, I like this because, as you know, the Swatch Neptune was so hard to uh, to make because it was bleeding on people's wrists when they first initially sold that they've kind of pulled all the, the blues back. And for a long, long time, for a good year or two, you couldn't get a Neptune for nothing because wow. they were afraid that it was going to bleed. So 
the Neptune Blues became so expensive to buy because you couldn't find one. So the ones that had it were selling it for like a thousand, two thousand dollars because you couldn't buy the blue Neptune out of the eleven that you couldn't buy. Obviously, the Mercury and the Moon which were the black case and the gray case were, were heavily favored because it looked like you make a Speedmaster. But the Neptune was like this blue thing that you know, when I first thought, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, but it's kind of hokey, right? Because what's blue? But when you couldn't get it, that was when everyone was like, oh, I need to add it. Right. Of course. That's the way it works. Yeah. And I think it was Daniel Craig who wore a blue Neptune uh, at one of the No Time to Die movie premieres that people were like, oh, James Bond is wearing one? I got to get one. <laughs> so that's how it all started. But one of the crazy thing about this one is because Moonshine, it got released, I think, uh, at the beginning of August, end of September, for their full moon as uh, for 2023, uh, they came out with the blue Neptune, but with a gold second hand. Uh, and that is the, the best of both worlds, because you have the 11 original swatch, moon swatches, and the Neptune had a white second hand on the original 11. But for the Moonshine version, it came out with a gold second hand. So I'm like, that's the best of both worlds. Get a gold secondhand and the Neptune blue, two birds with one stone. So I'm wearing that now at this moment on a uh, Charlie Brown NATO, right? Because of yeah. pop. Well, and it also just kind of reminds me of the Ukraine a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. The, bl- the blue and yellow. Yeah. God bless Ukraine. Whatever whatever they're doing there, my heart goes out to them. It's crazy. You know, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. And of course, on my on my left hand, I'm wearing the new Antarctic white uh, Blanc Pond swatch collab. Okay, so you're both they're both swatches. So it it almost it answers my question twice because they're both swatches, so they're the same. But one's a Blanc Pond, one's an Omega, so they're different. So you do in fact wear different watches at the same time sometimes. But I guess they're both swatches though, still. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. But the next time I promise I'll wear two different ones. Just Okay. <laughs> Dude, it's no no concern. It was just kind of a every time we've hung out it, it's been uh brand brand and I think in like other interviews I've seen of you like as well, I think maybe the same brand. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Not it it uh, yeah, it was just something curious. Yeah. I never took notice of it. But now that you mentioned it, I'm going to try my best to break it up. Oh, I'm in his head. I'm in his head. <laughs> Dean, <laughs> you you hold you hold influence on me, sir, <laughs> Wesley of Standard H. That's so funny. I'm kind of curious. You're also very well known, not just for for you know watches and double wristing and such, but your selfie game is really strong. Like you have a very very strong selfie game on on the interwebs. I'm curious when you take these photos with these people. Is is the approach is the is the line the same line, like hey let me get a selfie or is it is it different per person and situation like what is what is this case by case scenario of the selfies? Well, it's because I live in Los Angeles, right? They they live here. A lot of them live yeah. here, um, so you do see them in you know coffee shops, shopping, events, concerts, you name it. They're there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I like I too like to be out and about just because like you know when are you gonna have this opportunity I'm a, I'm a son of an immigrant uh, so I always kind of want to take advantage of life because you know life is short you eat dessert first right you, you go sure. out you do what you can uh, and plus you know the the experience is like no other because who knows I might um, I might move eventually somewhere else you know my my wife was always talking about retiring back in Taiwan and I'm oh, like wow. really if I go back to Taiwan then you know no more. Uh, Cool things, right? Los Angeles, New York, uh, the fast pace, if you will. So I'm always trying to take advantage of, of, of things like that because, you know, guess what? When are you ever going to have that opportunity again? Right. Take, take it. Take the shot. So when I would see someone that I would recognize, I would, number one, re- try to remember like, okay, what was this person in? What movie were they in? Why do I like them? Because I think some celebrities are, are so used to getting selfies that if you ask one, they'll just say, yes, of course. Some are a little bit more, you know, private. They may not want to be in pictures because you don't know, they don't know what you're using it for, right? Or if they're really, really high status, it's almost like, oh, I'm getting asked a thousand times and you really don't want to bother them. So it depends on the type of scenario that you're in. It also depends where you are. Um, There are celebrities who are with your families and with that, you kind of, I leave them alone because they're with your family. It's a no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in parent mode at, at that stage. Um. But yeah, when I see someone, I, I initially go up to them and I'm honest. I'm like, hey, I'm a huge fan. Love you. Sometimes we have mutual friends. 
because uh, mm-hmm. I had become friends with some some you know stars slash movie stars because of a uh, of the watches because of cigars because of uh, you know from a friend of a friend so they I sometimes will say oh we have a mutual friend and who that person is and sometimes you know they'll look at me like you're lying there's no way you know that guy and uh, you know but okay for, a for effort you want a picture come on come here okay. <laughs> You know, they, they always will think I'm either a, a Japanese tourist or something because, uh, you know, I am very giddy when it, when I see because I get starstruck. I, I, I do because for me, it's kind of like, you know, they've done something that is kind of hard to do to, to repeat a line 80 times sometimes to get it right, to be able to have one teardrop come out of the right eye at the right moment. That's skill. That is skill. Um, I can't do that, but it's just kind of cool, you know. So, yeah, these selfies, um, I always like to call myself what? I'm a collector of oddities. I am a social scoundrel and an occasional gentleman. Yes, yes. All all very true. I stand by those statements. <laughs> those are the three things I always I call myself. It's actually on my business card when I when I when I have the time to give them out if I if I ever happen to have them with me. Yeah. Okay, so I obviously know you through the early days of talking watches, of course. Um, like, how, how did you get on Hodinkee's radar so early? Because that was still sort of like, I don't know, Gen 1, if you will, of Hodinkee, in my opinion. That's right. It was very, very early. Um, I was lucky because, I, because I'm always out there. I always like meeting new people. I always like being exposed or exposing myself to new things, right? And just... Why not try it out? If you don't like it, at least you try it. You know you don't like it. But totally. I always am willing to play ball, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so during the 2010 Heritage Tag Hoyer Hoyer event, um, and prior to that, I was buying watches, you know, on the dash with Jeff Stein, um, also like VRF Vintage Rolex Forum, all these different you know websites that I started collecting on uh, after after high school. Right. And back in 2001, when the Nintendo was still kind of young, buying stuff on eBay, buying Hoyer Carreras, which I loved at the time because they came out the re-edition back in the early 2000s. Yeah. And I really dove into it. So I kind of got in touch and I realized that I was bidding against eBay bids against like Chuck Maddox, who was like an Omega slash Hoyer uh, collector, Jeff Stein, who was a, a Hoyer, uh, you know, guru. Um, and we became friendly. Because at the time, you were able to contact each other and say, you know, sit and write to each other. So Jeff will write to me or someone else and be like, hey, you, you won that. Good deal. That's a great price. That's a great piece. You know, what else are you looking for? I might, you know, let's do some trading. Let's, let's you know, let's become friendly. Let's, let's, let's agree to bid on certain things without surpassing it. Otherwise, all these prices would just be so unaffordable for us. And I was, I, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense at the time. So I was invited to go to the Hoyer Heritage Summit. And that was when you had so many international Hoyer collectors, like Jeff Stein was invited. You had Paul Gavin. Uh, you had uh, Richard Crosway. You had uh, uh, Ibel. You had all these like really, really cool Hoyer international collectors that were really renowned at the time. And they would, of course, go to uh, Basel at the time before Watches and Wonders now. But um, every year they would be going. And I was invited to the 2010 one uh, by uh, the heritage director, Catherine, Catherine De Brew. And she was wonderful. Great, great person. And when I was there, I got in touch with this young guy named Eric Wind. He was at the time a GQ contributor, which I didn't know at the time. He was just a cool cat, young, young guy. He didn't even have kids yet. He was married, uh, but he was didn't have children. And we were just sitting on the train on our way to uh, to the Tag Quarry Museum. We, we had a you know, he was from America and I was from America. I was like, yeah, we started getting in touch and we spoke and we really got along. And as you know about Eric, he is a lot more verbal now. But yeah. back then he was, he had a deep voice. Everything he said was meticulously chosen. Each word he said was very, very selective. So when he would speak, he had some pauses and I like, I would have to lean in and be like, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? And every time he said something, I was like, yo, this guy is now I know why you're a GQ contributor because he knows so much. Right. Um, but be you know, I'm I myself, I'm kind of goofy, you know, I'm I'm like a kid. So I treat everyone the same. I right. uh you know, I, I respect you for the craft. We're collectors, you know, first and foremost. And I love to learn new things. I'm I always realize coming from New York that if you're the guy mm-hmm. that talks too much and says that you know everything, you actually know nothing. Right. Right. 
So I make a point to, I'm a great hype man. I always say, yo, that's fire. That's great. Yo, that's amazing. Yo, that's amazing, man. Dude, kick ass. So a lot of, I have a lot of fluff words, but I really don't have much substance to say because I don't really work too much. Right. (laughs) What's a, well then on on that note like what's your approach to collecting then because like do you buy sell trade still or or ever or have you always just been sort of I love this I want this like what what like how do you decide on what to buy and what not to buy Um cuz you're sort of brand agnostic at this point it seems I do like things that are chronographs I like okay. chronographs things that have chronographs my first my first first love really was kind of like trying to think what was my first chronograph that I just said, oh my gosh, I love this. I think it was a, I think it was the Hoyer. The Hoyer Carrera was really my first chronograph that I really enjoyed. Obviously, when I was younger, I would, you know, the fossil watches, the nautical watches back in the day, sure, they, had, sure. you know, they had the fake chronographs. They really didn't tell time, but one had like, one had like, uh, I don't know, the days of the week that you can click the hand to because they had different movements on them. Um, but I like the fact that you had three registers, you had the buttons, so it kind of made the whole watch a little bit more busier, if you will. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was trying to that look and that design. I felt like, you know, the subs or even one that just told analog time, I, I just felt that it was just a little bit too, too simple, too timeless. But although yeah. I, I love a great, uh, you know, a Cartier tank, I love the subs, I love, uh, the mill gouges, I love, you know, even the swatches now, beautiful looking watches that are just simple and timeless and elegant. But at the time, I liked chronographs. So I started collecting Hoyers. I started collecting Breitlings, right? The chronomats, uh, the Navitimers. They were beautiful. Um, The Omegas, of course, the Speedmasters were classy. My uncles back in the 70s, 80s all had Omegas. Um, But they also had a lot of yellow gold, gold chains, gold bracelets, gold rings. Jersey. Bruce Lee kind of look. You know, the shirt was kind of a bit low. They had the gold. They had a jade Buddha. It was just kind of like... Wow, that's pimping back in the in the seventies, eighties. Because uh, I was born in seventy five, so in my late seventies, I still I have a fairly good memory of my my of my childhood. So I remember them a lot, and mm-hmm. they would come and just you know hang out with me. So from growing up in the seventies and eighties, I just had that exposure of of what that type of watch was. So I was always into that. So chronographs is kind of what I love, really love. The Hoyer, Omega, Rolex, Breitling. I think those are the four that I really, really enjoyed wearing. And Omega, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. I that. But, you know, coming from a, you know, blue-collar boy from Queens, I'll, everyone that I worked with or saw that came into the store that I see on the bus or even in high school, a lot of them just were like, they were, they were sports swap models and tool watches. Yeah. So that was very prevalent. You know, a lot of uh, Submariners, a lot of, you know, tag Hoyers, if you will, or Hoyer uh, Octavias that they would wear back in the day because I was, I was born in Queens. So a lot of people did wear those brands and of course omega was ubiquitous everyone had an omega um rolex not so much they were more the the bosses they had the presidents they had the uh the oyster perpetual so that was a little bit more like oh when i would hit my hand in manhattan you'd see a lot more rolexes at the time right but those are the brands that i always kind of like gravitated towards um i don't really collect paddocks you know vacheron or uh, pp or, or ap automatic only because I felt like that is that was out of my league. I feel like you know it was more aristocratic. My my rich uncle should be wearing that, not me, not not a guy. Right. Like Interesting. It's funny because I I I know you from your vintage pieces, but I also know you from your your modern pieces as well. Um, do you have a favorite chronograph of all time? If you were to narrow it down, it's got to be tough. Oh uh, yeah, I do enjoy probably the. Gosh, your favorite one, huh? Um, I do find myself wearing um, my speedies a lot more, only because, at least lately, because right now the political climate and the economic climate is kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I definitely wear my swatches. Uh, there's these two swatches that I really love, the Upper East Side and the uh, Upper West Side, which is the black and the white versions of the swatch. It's uh, from the swatch irony line so the case is kind of is steel and so is the battery cap so it won't crack off on you because a lot of these swatches that were made out of plastic back in the day and after x amount of years you know the, the cap would just fall off and you have to end up taping your battery into the case <laughs> right. and you know god forbid you have to wash your hands right so i like right. the iron cases because at least metal and metal it, it lasts a lot longer but you know i post those pictures those are classic you know they're, they're, they're quartz 
And I bought maybe three or four each. So in case one does die, I'll have another one lined up. One to rock and one to stock, right? Yeah. Um, but those were some of the, the favorites that I would wear. But going back to your question about my favorite chronograph. Yeah, in a vacuum, in a vacuum, you know, there's there's no no pricing associated, just strictly on either your experience or wearability or, or design mainly, I guess. Cause I'm, I'm an aesthetics driven guy. So even when you go back to the vintage and, and I noticed your collage behind you, that's like attributed to, to Newman there. That's, that's a, did you make that collage or? Um, it was from a collector from France. Oh, cool. He had, he was an artist and he had made this for himself because he loved Paul Newman's, and he had made this for himself and he had it hung in his back living room. And I remember looking at it because, you know, he at the time I was already collecting Newman's. I was collecting every single variant yeah. in stainless steel, the white, the panda and reverse panda dials. And he reached out to me. He's like, yo, man, like I'm a I've got this Newman. I've got this chronograph. I've got this Daytona. And we would share stories. And, you know, we, it was it was a really nice, good friendship we had. So then yeah. one day he was like, yo, man. I made this for myself, but I think you deserve it. I think you want it. I think I'm going to give it to you. What's your address? I'm mailing it to you. Wow. I was like, really? Like you, like you made that, right? He's like, yeah, you know, it, it belongs to with you. That's also not small. So to ship that from France, like that must have been a, I don't know, a few hundred bucks. Easy. <laughs> I think so. Right. It yeah. was like, it showed up in like this huge, massive wooden crate that he had put together. Wow. Jeremy, so guys, that's such a great, great, great collector friend, and that's the great thing about watch community. I was gonna say that's a that's a testament to the community. You know what I mean? You know, there's so many things that uh, these watch collectors do for each other because they understand that the toils and tribulations that you have to go through to get a certain piece. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes we, it's this collecting community is bigger than us. You know, it's not us. It's not about who's got the better watch, better condition. It's the whole brand as a whole. Yeah, we were talking about like you know off off the the podcast we we're talking about the Rolly fest recently that just happened mm -hmm. you know it was 175 members from 17 countries every single one of them renowned in their own right they have podcasts they have youtube channels they had you know instagram handles whatever it is that you name they they're really well known a lot and they're humble as anything they gave us their time their expertise they would look at a watch and you know they would explain about it what they thought what they knew and no one ever said you know this is the authority what i'm saying is gospel nothing like that how, do, how so okay so for the, the for the uninitiated i guess what is roly fest how do you get to go and i don't know if it's counterintuitive or, or counter I don't know if it's a counter to what we were just talking about, which was alluding to the inclusivity in the community. Is it inclusive or is it exclusive? It's a little bit of both. Yeah. Basically, it's in a nutshell. Jeff Hess, as you know, is a renowned collector from New York City. He was with Phyllis before. He was with, he's with Sotheby's now. And he's been in New York forever. So he knows a lot of people. And sure. him being in Phillips. And so the bees, he's been around the watch community forever. He himself is a very renowned collector himself. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Hess is just this big kid who loves watches, who happen to have friends that love watches too, who happen to know people that in New York City that had rental spots, like the Rainbow Room, like the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier Museum, like the Natural Museum of History, because he's done all these events. So... I guess on, on paper, it looked like, oh my gosh, it's such an exclusive spot, but it was just a get together. That's all it was. Right. There's also a crazy collecting forum in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Asylum right. is the one club that these guys are crazy. One of my dear friends, Ronnie, he runs or is part of the, the founding fathers of that term. They have t shirts. I think they even have tattoos on their asses. I don't even know. <laughs> you know, but. I would not be surprised if there is a crown on their left cheek. It, they're that crazy about it. Wow. And rightfully so. Sure. I would have a tattoo myself, but I'm allergic to pain. So I, uh, <laughs> I have a tattoo. Uh, not voluntarily, at least. Right. But uh, going back to this whole rolling fest, yeah, it was just a guy who wanted to, see, to have friends, to have watches and, and enjoy it. But here in L.A., 
I am part of like five or six watch get togethers clubs also that meet regularly either either at a restaurant or at a um, you know country club where it's a little bit more safe because of the climate now. But mm-hmm. yeah, guys who are plumbers, guys who are attorneys, guys that are doctors, guys that were you know entrepreneurs, business people, cool guys, they show up. Yeah, and we're all on the same level. We're looking at each other's watches. We're we're applauding each other. You know sharing stories of how they got the watches because you know it's 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 a it's a legacy it's a trip it's it's a story and it's wonderful and, and it combines us together the experiences are great I, there's people that i know there was a last even there at south coast plaza i think on the same weekend as roly fest in september watch time right it was awesome i was there at the i was at that event last year and it was phenomenal like over easily over 150 people yeah i think so are you talking about the watch time event? Yes. At South Coast? Yeah, I went to that this year. And it was the first time I'd gone. And it was, yeah, well, it's it's the same. So it's the publication, watch time, obviously. That's who puts it on. Then all of the stores contribute. They have like drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And you sign up to go. It doesn't cost a dime. Um, and then it's the same weekend in New York in October as Wind Up. So I'm stuck in my booth in, in a great way possible, by the way. Not I don't stuck. I use that term loosely. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't attend watch time in New York because I'm at wind up, obviously, selling my, my wares, so to speak. But with Rolly Fest, do you, do you pay to go to that? Yes, there is a fee okay. because you are. It's not sponsored. Yeah, it's dinner and all that. Um. Obviously, there are certain collectors that have more means than others. And, of course, these events that are there, because you're coming from New York City and there are a lot of international uh, guests, there's no way you can all fit at a, you know, Tony Roma's or, uh, you know. So you have to have an event, a rented venue in order to kind of keep it uh, private and, and at least safe in that essence. Sure, sure. And obviously, a lot of these bigger gun collectors, they have things that are just, you can't replace them. And they're worth mm-hmm some considerable cheddar that you know god forbid some some guy spots you and knows what it is you're going to be in big trouble so yeah so you can understand why there is a little bit more of a you know security slash hush hush to it but it is just a really nice watch get together yeah that's cool and I, I i tell people like if you don't have one that's local in you you should, that's your cue to start one start it yeah exactly start it there's one in Pasadena right here that uh, that I go to when I get invited because sometimes uh, they forget to invite me. I'm like, yo, invite me. And they're like, oh, man, sorry. We, there's too many watches, man. I, I forget about you. I'm like, I completely get it because wow. when you talk about watches and these little things that tell time, it's, it's you know, it, it overcomes you. It's yeah. like it's better than women because women, uh, you don't have to. You can have more than one. Uh, you, can, you can pick up this watch and – Touch this watch anytime you like, and and not get get slapped or uh, or get complaints about. Um, it's just it's just it's just beautiful. It really is. It really reminds you of how life great can be, how how great life can be. Okay, so you're not going to get off the hook. What's your one chronograph? Ah, I was hoping that you'd forget that you are <laughs> sharp as a sharp as a taxer. Um, okay, if I had to, probably my one six five twenty Zenith Movement Daytona. Is that is that a white dial? Yes, the one that I'm thinking about is the white dial, the standard okay. white dial. That's my favorite of of the Zeniths. It's it's a white dial steel bezel. Love that one. Yeah, I just I love that era. I love because it's it's where, if I'm not mistaken, not to get too nerdy here, but it's where the running seconds is at nine o'clock, right? Yes. Okay, so that's the Zenith where it went to what six o'clock? Correct. Correct. For, it's for uh, in house. Also- and this is before Rolex actually went into vertical integration, decided to have their own movement. Right, right, yeah. Uh, and but I thought I that was also my first Daytona. Uh, I was when I bought my engagement ring at Ben Bridge. Um, the beautiful and talented Charlene Hardman, who is a dear friend of mine still, she was the one that said, "You need a watch now, sir. Now that you're getting married, you're a big boy. You need to get. You need a watch." I was like, "What can I get?" And she said, you know, I happen to know, this is back when Ben Ridge was a Rolex authorized dealer. Well, and she did you a favor. <laughs> she did me a huge favor. She's like, would you like to see it? I'm like, so she brought it out. It was a, a P-serial, 165 Pony Zenith. And she's like, it's yours. 
Do you still have it? Five thousand dollars MSRP back so in two thousand one. Okay, it was two thousand one. Okay, so that same era, I was working for Banana Republic at Crabtree Valley Mall in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I remember this guy comes in. I I'll never forget this. Um, and this was like. It may have been 99, actually, 99, 2000, somewhere around there. Um, and I was working in the front of the store. The store had just been renovated. So we were excited to show off the new men's side, you know, because uh, the men's was always in the back before. And then it went side by side. So we were at the front of the store all of a sudden. Exciting times for retail, right? So I worked store number 4136 at Natick Mall. Amazing. Hell so yeah. you and me are Bernard Republic brothers, man. I know. Gap Incorporated. Let's go. You and I can fold clothes like like nobody else. Oh God. The the number of chinos is like limitless. Like that. So so this guy walks in with this little bag and he was just beaming. You know how like pregnant women glow? Like this guy was glowing. Like, and I was like, dude, what, how are you doing? And he's like, man, I am so good. He's like, I just, I finally got my watch. I've waited three years for this watch. And I was like, what? So whenever the, maybe the, that era of Daytona was announced, it was three years after that. Cause he was, I think one of the earlier guys to, to, to place his order or whatever. And I was like, dude, I don't, I mean, I'm into watches. I, I rock a Swiss Army that my grandmother gave me for you know high school graduation. I love it. Um, I got to see this watch. What watch did you wait three years for? And he opens it up, and it was a white dial Daytona. And I'll never forget it. To this day, is still one of my favorite Daytonas. I mean, mine is 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 probably the the Panda. Honestly, the the Newman Panda. I mean, even non Paul Newman, I mean, I'll t whatever black bezel, like I just, what, what is that? Six, two, four, one would be the pump pusher. Yeah. And then with the screw down is the, uh, was it six, two, six, five, six, two, six, three, six, two, six, three. That's it. Yeah. Well, cause the screw down. Yeah. The five was the silver bezel, right? The steel, the steel bezel. Right. So. At any rate, those are those are my favorites. It, so they're coincidentally both white dial Daytonas. But um, yeah, I'll never forget that day. And I was like, still, it's one of my favorite Rolexes. But this was long before I knew anything about a Paul Newman Daytona. <laughs> you know, right? None of us really knew, right? Back then, yeah. because we're, I think I'm a little bit older than you, but like we caught yeah. up early. We looked yeah. at it we're like, yo, yeah, this is something I'm in for the long haul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is uh? What was your first car? Ooh, my first car was a hand-me-down. My brother had an Acura Integra. Sweet. And he called her Ingrid, and it had a hundred and ninety thousand miles on it, which he gave to me. And I drove it around in Boston for a good two years, until I graduated, moved to Miami, and gave it to my younger brother David, who oh, cool. rode it for another one hundred. 20,000 miles. Wow. And after it died with like 400,000 plus miles on it, my brother Jackson took off the steering wheel and hung it on his wall. It's still there now. That's awesome. What color was the car? Gray. Dark gray. What's your daily now? What are you driving? I drive a, oh, I, I, my, well, my choice of car is my Range Rover. I have a 2010. Rover. I love it because back in, in Boston when it was snowing, nobody was driving out on the streets except for these rovers. I was like, yo, this is this car is crazy. And they're like, oh, Queen Elizabeth rides in this. I was like, oh, <laughs> if it's good for the Queen, right? If, and the Pope. Wasn't the Pope driving a rover too? Or is he, does he get a Mercedes? I forget. Well, he has that like glass, like he's like in glass, right? The Pope Mobile isn't like a white car with like a, with like the, I don't know, gun or bulletproof. Like bulletproof, bulletproof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fishbowl, right? The yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it might be a Mercedes or a Cadillac or. I feel like it's a Mercedes. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, what color is your Rover? White. It is white. Only by choice because back in the day, I had we were able to. Um, I was a big Rover fan, so every but we would lease our cars because. <laughs> Back in the day, I just kind of liked it. You know, rovers are, as you know, notoriously not 
great when they're new, but not great when they're older. Right. So I had in my mind to just lease every three years or every five years, get a yeah. new one because after year five, they just start breaking. Yeah. You're all cut. Co- you're covered the whole time. Yes. So I, 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 I like it. I drive around in it. I get to, it's my, one of my few pleasures in life where it's a, it's my smoking car. So when oh, I drive the rover, I get to smoke cigars in it. Um, cause that's the only one that the kids and the wife refuse to get into. So it's like, it's my time. I love that. Um, but you know, other than that, if, if I'm not in that, I'm I'm in like either the, the Tesla, which is the family car, or uh, the minivan, uh, which I'm in that more often than not. But that's okay, you know. It's easy as, as cake, and um, I love it. That's amazing. Okay, I need it, dude. I really appreciate you taking the time. This is this is all I got for you. Unless you did you want to talk about anything else? Promote? Do you have anything to promote? I don't even know if you have anything to promote. I am just a guy that likes to hang out with my buddies like you, man. I yeah. am, I am a professional husband, a professional hus- a personal father, if you will. Uh, I'm in real estate right now, so a lot of it is unless I'm renting things out. I'm I'm basically chilling, you know, having a good time, running back and forth, doing whatever the wife tells me. Right. Okay, I'm curious on the real estate front. Um, it's something I've gotten into. Um, what is your approach? Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it commercial? Is it residential? What states are you in? Just curious. Well, it's a partnership. This this is also a different podcast. Like we could probably talk a whole other hour on this, but the with the Cliff's Notes. Yeah, with the Cliff Notes, with real estate, um, it's it's a it's a collab. Or honestly, it's my wife. My wife is my boss in life and in business. She's always been the my boss. Even when we had the security camera business, she was my boss. Right. I was kind of. She's always the one that charges. She's kind of like the the guy with the sword that's in the front waving, and I'm the one that's sitting behind her with the <laughs> with the shield covering her ass, making sure she doesn't get hit by arrows in the back. Right. So she's always led the charge. So when we decided the security cameras, she led that. I just was helping her with the sales. Now with real estate, she also looked at it and said, you know what, we should get into this because Mm -hmm. it's something that in LA, it was the way to go. Uh, So I just said, okay, let's do it. Whatever you want to do. So after we got rid of or retired the the company that we did security cameras for after 20 years, we we started investing in in real estate. We first started doing commercial a little bit, but then we realized that it was kind of volatile because we had a lot of businesses that were coming in and out of business. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. although it was cool to have, um, we knew that everyone had it had it to live in a place personally or in a yeah. residential place. So we started focusing more on residential uh, neighborhoods. We kind of focused in point of pride cities, meaning places where people want to live. Like, yeah, so, you know, uh, Highland Park, uh, Silver Lake, Pasadena, Los Angeles, Melrose. These are areas that, you know, no matter what, you will always have people who want to live there. So why not invest in places like that? So we realized that if you were to have kind of like either bungalows or um, um, places that have front and back with an ADU, additional uh, dwelling unit in the back, yeah, uh, it would it would have a higher return. So that's what we kind of started doing. But with the interest rates now, which is at around six percent, it's harder to buy. It's hard to buy and renovate and rent because of it's just harder, you know, just to to uh, have a bigger portfolio. But back in the day, when it was like two percent, we were a lot. It was a lot easier to invest in, renovate, and rent out. Most of our tenants are about one year because a lot of them are like actors, um, you know, artists. As far as um, they're working at Sony Productions, Paramount, um, you know, Warner Brothers. So they have normally like a year contract, and then after that, they they go back to wherever they they came from, or if things well are well, they need to get to a bigger place, right? Because you know you have to start small. Everything big starts small somehow, somewhere. Yeah. We've uh, we have a lot of like students from School of Berkeley in, in Newberry Street, Boston. So you know they're your next Taylor Swift and your and Charlie Puth and all these you know talented, gifted people. Um, so we find that renting residential in private of ownership cities is profitable. That's kind of what we're doing now, mostly in Los Angeles, only because if something ever does go wrong, uh, we at least can handle it because we always want to be hands on landlord slash real estate people in the sense that if something's wrong because it's just you know the toilet's gonna overflow the pipe's gonna break the i uh yeah i re- i replaced uh, a toilet seat last week like just 
you know what I mean? So it's, it's one of those things. What, uh, so, so you don't have a property manager, you guys manage them. This is the property manager right here, sir. Good for you, man. I love that. I unclog toilets. I, I fix things that I know how, if I can't, then obviously you have to call someone. Yeah, sure, sure. But, uh, but I always do go, I want to make sure that I know the tenants, the tenants know me because you know, for me, it's all about integrity. It's like anything in life. Integrity is the only thing that you get to give out freely. Dude. I, so my wife, <laughs> she, um, she'll tell you that like my life is surrounded and, and sort of driven by integrity and it's, I'm finding it to be more and more rare that integrity even exists in our society, sadly, and not to get Debbie Downer, but like, I'm starting to believe that like your integrity, my integrity, or like just attributes that we were born with, like our eye color, you know what I mean? And it's just like, as sad as it is, it's sort of factual. If you had to give one piece of advice to those looking to get into rental real estate or real estate investment, what would it be? Wow. That is a very great question. I've never been asked that. Um, I think if you're honest, good or bad, because lies have very short legs. Yeah. If you lie about something and saying this is a great neighborhood where it's not, oh, right. you can find out. Yeah. And that affects your integrity, right? Because if people don't trust you, then what's the point? Anything you say is useless. Okay, so let me rephrase the question. If you're searching for a tenant, what should you be looking for? Ah, that human connection is key. I mm -hmm. make it a point to meet every single tenant that rents or wants to rent. So there's this one place that I have right now in Atwater Village. It's right off uh, uh, Glendale Boulevard, which is kind of where, you know, Proof Bakery is, you know, yeah. Closet, uh, you know, uh, gosh, so all Adina Books, great area to, to eat, great area to shop. But the coolest thing about it is you have a whole bunch of like really colorful, artistic people. Yeah. Um, and we had an open house and there was 125 people that showed up. Cool. And I met, I, I made sure I met every single one. I remember, I tried to remember their names. I tried to remember what they did, where they're from, why they want to have this place because that human connection is key. You can tell someone's not all there. Yeah. It's, a, it's the energy. Yeah, for sure. You know, and you have to trust your gut. And that is my only thing. Don't, don't disassociate yourself from your tenants. Make yeah. sure they know, make sure they have your number. If they bother you and call you, they're calling you for a reason. Answer the phone. Yeah. It's if you, it's cause it's your place that they're kind of taking care of also, right? Sure. They're living their dreams. They're living their life and you want positive energy and positive vibes in that home because you know, we all rented at one point in our lives. We all knew what, how of a nightmare it was. Mm hmm and I kind of want to change that because there's enough negativity in this world. Right, right, right. Don't be a cause of another one. Have good vibes. Be a good person. Be a good influence. Be a good inspiration because it's kind of passing on the kindness, if you ask me, right? Do you have like mnemonic devices or anything for remembering people's names? Because that's something else that I know about you. You're really good at it. Uh, yes and no. I, as you know, I'm, I'm known as Mediocre Morgan at the Magic Castle. I like magic only because... I got into it when my kids were in grade school and a teacher was a magician and she taught me something that was just downright crazy. And I was just like, whoa, that's just freaking amazing. Um, so I go to the Magic Castle and part of the things that they do is remembering names. And that's really, really hard. So I do give you like an adjective at times if I don't remember you. Like if it's hard to like, like I call you Wild Wesley because you're wild. Every time we hang out, it's just fun. You know, your 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 gang of friends are all over the place from different walks of life, but they're all great. You know, you really can tell how a person is by his friends. And you, my friend, are one of the one of the ones to keep. Oh, uh, you're the best, man. You're the best. Thank you. Um and likewise for sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Me, good thing for Meteorical Morgan. Or yes. mischievous, Morgan, depending <laughs> how you see it. But I always put an adjective in front of my name just so it helps you kind of remember. Uh, you know what they are. That's that's kind of my key. There are right. different uh, techniques that you can't remember. I, there's a magician, a fellow magician. His name is uh, Matt O'Neill. He literally will remember your name once he starts his effect. And he will name your name as you leave and as you come in. And then while you're at the castle and he sees you in the hallway, he will call you out by your name again. He is phenomenal. Wow. And he inspired me to be like that.
craziness. And honestly, it's like anything, even like the waitress and waitresses that you have and the waiters that you have, even like, you know, airline pilots and, and, and staff. If you know them by their name, you call them by their name, you know, you get better service because they feel that they're seen, right? They yeah. you get that contact, that human contact, which I think we've lost a lot of because of COVID and this social media bit. You know, you need a human connection. You need to be able to shake someone in the hand, look them in the eye, smile, you know? Yeah, totally. It's like no other, you know, I believe humans are like social animals and they need to be, they need to hang out. They need to, you know, gossip about things. They need to, uh, you know, exchange you know, ideas on a graceful level, of course, because, you know, that that also is crazy. So it disagrees with you nowadays. It's like, oh, well, we're going to cancel you, uh, which I think is ridiculous. Come on. It's yeah. it's OK to disagree. Right. What's, what's wrong with that? I totally agree. I, I couldn't agree more. Morgan, thanks, man. Thank you so much for the time. This is it's never a dull moment with you. Uh, I can't wait to light up a cigar the next time in L.A. Thank you, sir. Really Any appreciate time. it. This wraps up this episode of the Standard Age Podcast. If you like what you heard, I'd love it if you'd share it with a friend or two. And if you have a moment, please rate and review the show as it helps others discover these episodes. It absolutely helps far more than you realize. Shout out to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.